So welcome everyone to this week's or this month quantum gravity across approaches seminar. And it is our very great pleasure to um, have Renate Loll from Nijmegen um, speaking to us today. Let me give a brief introduction. So Renate did her PhD at Imperial College in London and then did postdocs at Bonn University, the international or the national um, center for nuclear physics in Florence, Syracuse University and Pennsylvania State University. And then she was a Heisenberg Fellow at the Albert Einstein Institute in Potsdam and afterwards a professor at Utrecht University. And right now she is professor at Radboud University in Nijmegen at the Institute for Mathematics, Astrophysics and Particle Physics. And some of her, uh, some of the awards that she has won over the many years was, for example, a Vichy Award by the Netherlands Organization for uh, Scientific Research. She's a member of the Royal uh, Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences. And right now she's a distinguished visiting research chair at the Perimeter Institute. And for her scientific achievements, you might uh, know her as one of the pioneers of causal dynamical triangulations, where some of the important results are, for example, a de Sitter um, volume profile of this quantum spacetime, um, derivation of the spectral dimension that, for example, on large scales you see for a four-dimensional spacetime, where it appears to be two-dimensional on short scales, and in most recent years, uh, Renate has tackled the question of observables, for example, curvature observables in this approach. And this brings us directly to the topic of today, namely observables for quantum gravity going non-perturbative. Thank you for the very kind introduction. I'm, I'm very happy to speak uh, to an international audience and uh, you know, to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is uh, quantum observables. And so the emphasis to, today will be on going non-perturbative. Um, kind of complementary uh, probably to what, what, what other people have said in this series uh, so far. Um, no, let me. Oops. Okay, ah, now we go. Now, um, so I will take this non-perturbative perspective, which gives a, a different slant on, you know, when on talking about um, uh, observables. So what I mean by that is insisting on describing both gravity and spacetime directly at or near the Planck scale. Um, in my case, using kind of standard quantum field theory, but adapting it to a situation where the geometry is dynamical and can also be strongly quantum fluctuating and will be in general. So very briefly, uh, to summarize what I will be talking about, I will first spend some time talking about uh, the standard classical formulation of gravity, how it differs, for example, from gauge, that of gauge field theory, and what that implies for observables. And that's, of course, specifically the role of the diffeomorphisms in, in, in gravity. Then I will define what I mean by a quantum observable and what it implies to go non-perturbative. Um, as a concrete illustration of these ideas, I will then talk about what one can do in the framework of causal dynamical triangulations or CDT and uh, describe you know, some concrete quantum observables and what we can and have already learned from them. Okay, let's start back in history. Let's go back to the mid 19th century uh, where actually some of the roots were laid to what I before called kind of the standard description of uh, general relativity. So here is Riemann in this picture. He was a, a student of Gauss and uh, wrote in his very famous habilitation uh, colloquium that you can find online also translated to English about really what we now would think of as the foundations of Riemannian geometry. Uh, so he described the metric structure of n-dimensional manifolds. That's of course originally a German word you should note uh, with a metric structure and how that can be characterized by an infinitesimal line element. So that's the ds squared here, very familiar to all of us, which captures of course uh, the local metric structure by a uh, symmetric two tensor g mu of x and these kind of infinitesimal um, coordinate quantities dx mu dx mu. It's quite interesting when you read his uh, colloquium that he was very much influenced by physics. 
and his intuition or what he calls you know, empiricism uh, accords with physical Newtonian considerations. However, what he already contemplates is that, well, both when you go to the immeasurably large, but more relevant for us, the immeasurably small, it may very well be that in the light of, you know, what physics may discover down the line, so let me just slightly rephrase what he says, these may ha have to be revisited, and in particular, this answer here for the infinitesimal line element may no longer be a good one. What is often uh, cited by people who like actual discrete formulations of, of gravity and quantum gravity is that he contemplates and juxtaposes continuous manifolds, so underlying in particular this infinitesimal construction, with the, the possibility that things might be actually discrete. And also arguing that counting is certainly more intuitive than measuring upon which he builds his notion of uh, geometry. Now, um, I would say, of course, this is very fundamental together with what also the Gauss did. This really lays the foundations of what we now use as in the form of pseudo Riemannian uh, geometry that is based on you know, using differentiable manifolds in general relativity as very uh, powerful and models of space time. So it starts our love affair with coordinates, as I'd like to call it somewhat provocatively. Okay, so this sets the stage for general relativity as we know it from textbooks. And here, just by, here you see this little illustration, which uh, incorporates this idea of describing a differentiable manifold, which we also end up with some metric structure, uh, and the manifold of being something that locally looks like an RN. And we can just use introduce little coordinate charts here uh, to describe, to, you know, to describe uh, extended neighborhoods on on this manifold that in general will, will be a curved uh, manifold. Uh, the beauty being that we can compute just like on our n with the help of these coordinate charts, and geometric properties then get encoded, of course, in G mu nu, but via its uh, second derivatives also in this. Uh, important quantities, the so-called Riemann curvature tensor, this uh, object with, with so many indices. Now, uh, of course, we can choose any coordinate system. Um, this will affect the functional form of the metric, but not the physics. So we are, in a way, we are free to choose such coordinate system, and that's kind of inherent in the entire construction. Now, this raises then the question that will also in the quantum theory be very important, namely, well, there is a redundancy in the description. So I have to be careful to distinguish between physics, so the, what is observable, and gauge. So in that case, you know, a mere coordinate effect. And that things can be a little subtle there is illustrated by you know, famous uh, pitfalls from the early and not quite so early days of general relativity uh, in interpreting certain, uh, you know, matrix geometries described, of course, in specific coordinate systems. So uh, famously, there's a long-standing confusion about the physical status of R equal to 2GM, of course, event horizon, in the Schwarzschild solution. And that started with Schwarzschild himself. So he was very puzzled by this, this you know, singularity, this coordinate, what we now know as a coordinate singularity. And he actually wanted to get rid of it by just you know, shifting the R coordinate by two GM. So this would sit at zero. Um, another example is a discussion around are gravitational waves real or are they coordinate effects? So Einstein first came up with them uh, and he identified lots of gravitational waves, you know, including uh, kind of longitudinal waves, which then were soon shown to be spurious because simple coordinate effects. And it went as far as Einstein, together with his collaborator Rosen, uh, writing famously an article and submitting it that all gravitational waves are just, uh, are not for real. So they're all coordinate artifacts, which of course was then quite quickly corrected by, by, by other people. Now, there's clearly potential to be confused, but on the whole, classically, 
you know, we've learned how to work with tensor calculus and uh, we regard, you know, the, the, the choices of different coordinate system as a freedom which we may actually exploit to our advantage to describe, you know, to take the best coordinate system that is suited to solving a certain problem. However, when it comes to the quantum theory, uh, uh, this freedom does really become a, a major headache in, in, in many respects. Now, having talked about, you know, discriminating physics and gauge um, makes gravity look like a gauge field theory with maybe similar issues that we are familiar with from, say, studying electromagnetism. But a GR, of course, to some extent is similar, but in other aspects is different from that of a, from a gauge field theory. So, of course, in specifically, we are not working with a fixed background space time. So, be it the Minkowski and Eta Minu metric or some other fixed background, but we're talking about a dynamical theory of space time. Now, uh, we have these diffeomorphisms. Yeah, they actually appear so diffeomorphism in the sense of global diffeomorphisms. You know, mapping points of the manifold M to other points, uh, rather regarding that as an active infinite dimensional group of symmetries uh, uh, of GR actually is an invariance of the theory. Now, this invariance under diff M, as I call this group actually employs that points of M have no direct physical significance. And that's something that was already noted and emphasized by, by Einstein himself. Now, physical space times uh, therefore correspond not to individual G mu news, but one way of saying is, is to say, well, any T2 G mu news that I can uh, relate by a global diffeomorphism are actually physically equivalent. So the true physics is lies in you know the diffeomorphism classes as indicated here by these square brackets by which one can also write kind of as this you know quotient of uh, or matrix on M of a certain signature modulo the four dimensional diffeomorphism. So these are kind of the true geometries if you like. Now unlike in Young Mill theory, this gauge group uh, therefore does not act locally, so at a point X, yeah, but it maps points into each other. So it's really a, a different a type of a symmetry and invariance, and that has consequences for observables, which we are thinking of as invariant quantities under these symmetry the mappings. So what happens uh, when, you, when you try and identify diff M invariant quantities, they are most easily constructed by taking just scalars and integrating them over all of space time. So as I've done here and this, you know, an obvious example is say to take the, the Ricci scalar. I mean, there's a double contraction of the Riemann tensor and integrating this over all space time. So that is a diff M invariant quantity, but it has this somewhat nasty feature of, of course of being very non-local. However, this will turn out to be a feature that will come back to haunt us also in quantum gravity where we have a similar issue, namely the need, for example, when we do, um, you know, a non perturbative bus integral, so that's kind of a sum over space times, we have a need to construct observables, which are well defined in an ensemble average. And also there, it's not possible, say, in pure gravity, kind of to, to pinpoint what you mean by the point x and uh, define that in an invariant meaning across the set of all space times in the path interval. So we are faced with a similar issue, namely when we want to compute uh, and construct quantum observables, they tend to be uh, non-local quantities. And that's of course, again, different from young will theory or say electromagnetism, right? Where F mu nu of X yeah, is just a, a local invariant and the gauge group just acts locally at the point X and you can identify uh, these invariants and, and work with them to characterize what you mean by true physics and, you know, true observables. Okay, so now what are quantum observables? Well, uh, we take them to be in a wider sense quantum analogs of functions on 
this space of geometry. So, uh, so I had this quotient space here on the previous slide. Now I'm giving it a name, curly G. So these are kind of the, the, the true degrees of freedom uh, of gravity. Yeah? And any function uh, on this configuration space is what, a, you know, is, is a classical observable and might give rise to a corresponding quantum observable, if you're lucky. Um, this is a difficult mathematical construction to handle. So the diffeomorphism, the full diffeomorphism group, we are talking beyond, you know, the linearized theory has a complicated action on this space of metrics. So uh, we don't actually have a, a, a nice way to parameterize this space of two degrees of freedom of gravity or a, a good way to get rid of or gauge fix a big redundancy uh, that is inherent in, in this symmetry under, under the four dimensional uh, diffeomorphism group. So that causes problems, not just in the construction of quantum observables, but of course in the construction of a theory of quantum gravity in the first place. Yeah, say, if you're doing a path integral quantization, well, you somehow have to get rid of all these you know, infinite uh, dimensions in your path integral if you want to have any hope of getting uh, finite results. So it, it causes problems uh, all over. Now, uh, the, the problem of observables is compounded um, whenever you take as a classical starting point of your quantum theory a formulation where the diffeomorphism, as a diff m, m being the four dimensional space time symmetry, is not manifest. So, uh, of course, a very important example being the ADM formulation, classical ADM formulation of general relativity, where you perform an arbitrary three plus one split uh, and you then do not have any more as a symmetry uh, algebra of the diffeomorphism, the algebra of the diffeomorphism group, but instead the, the infamous Dirac algebra. And of course, it has consequences for how you define observables and you get, you know, you, you, you have to contend with the whole paraphernalia of, you know, Dirac constraint systems classically, but then also in some a quantum, quantum version. That's not what I will be talking about today. So I will be really staying within a, a covariant uh, language. Now, uh, of course, it will depend what observables are and how you construct them in the quantum theory, how diff m appears in your quantum theory. Yeah. And that's, of course, uh, again, a tricky question or, uh, well, it will not be, it's not handled uniformly, uh, depending on, on where you are. It you know, ranges anywhere from kind of being ignored completely to, well, uh, well, we get to that. So um, many problems clearly here, and one wonders, okay, maybe we are able to handle these issues say in a con uh, say in a in a perturbative setting like you know perturbative quantum gravity, uh, which in an effective sense you know I uh, may be a good description up to certain uh, energy scales, but now really truly going non-perturbative isn't this completely doomed to failure? Can we can we address any uh, of these issues at all? And that's of course uh, in principle an excellent. Question now. Uh, so, what what do we expect then in in such a non-perturbative regime? So, as I already said when I introduced uh, the subject of my talk, I'll be working on the assumption that I have a formulation where the old ds squared, I mean, where ds squared of Riemann, the infinitesimal line element, and smooth assignment of some g mu nu of x tensors is no longer available. So, and, you know, for hand wavingly uh, for why that may very well be a good uh, starting point is this little picture on the left, right, where we are zooming in on a piece of empty space or space time. Uh, and once we get to near the Planckian regime, space time dissolves in some into some quantum foam or some yeah, space-time foam. So uh, where quantum fluctuations are so large 
that we don't expect, uh, that the old Riemannian way of describing geometry is still adequate, uh, also not in an effective sense. So what do we do in such a context when we cannot uh, rely on that? Uh, and in addition, uh, also cannot rely on background structures, so external reference structures, you know, classical looking boundaries or things. And so we are really sitting somewhere in this, in this quantum form of geometry. Can we make sense of notions of quantum observables? Um, now, uh, why do we want to have such observables in, in the first place? Well, obviously to kind of try and understand what goes on near the Planck scale, uh, but also as a way to compare different candidate theories of quantum gravity. Um, and that, in my view, I've, I've been advocating as a much more meaningful thing rather than compare underlying frameworks, which you know, differ so much in terms of their <laughs> ingredients and, and assumptions, uh, that you can never agree on what's the right thing to do. However, you know, if you have a uh, operationally well-defined invariant quantum observable in the best of all worlds, you may be able to compute this in more than one approach. And that gives you then a basis for comparing and maybe identifying differences or maybe even universal features. And of course, the example of the spectral dimension, which I'll mention just briefly later, uh, illustrates it very well. Now, why can we be hopeful that going non-perturbative is not a complete non-starter? Well, in terms of what we can do computationally and mathematically, we have, of course, come a long way since 1845, uh, 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 54, when, when Riemann wrote his habilitation there. So, just think of you know, advances in discrete, combinatorial, uh, computational, and of course, simplicial geometry you know, that enable us to talk about geometry beyond classical Riemannian or pseudo Riemannian uh, metric spaces. Now, however, also recall, now we are going quantum. Uh, in general, this will mean that these observables, of course, will have to be regularized and renormalized. We are in a quantum field theoretic context, yeah, and this will need to happen, and you, have to, you will need to define uh, how, how to do this. Now, that raises a bunch of important and uh, very relevant questions. So, uh, you know, am I talking about a set of measure zero? Do such observables actually exist? So what do they describe? Uh, can we compute anything? Um, in, in terms of comparing with the classical theory, so which notions, uh, maybe even underlying notions, things like you know time, causality, etc., uh, or a notion like curvature, persist in in a Planckian regime and which cannot be made sense of. And anyway, where has the diffeomorphism uh, group uh, gone? Now, well, is that a good? Uh, let let me say something about this slide. So, uh, so we need some expectation management, um, which I've learned when you know talking about non-perturbative quantum gravity and observables uh, specifically. So one really has to realize that you know what one thinks of as kind of quantum geometry very generally, you know, as illustrated by this beautiful little picture here coming from a, a two-dimensional toy model of of, of quantum gravity is something totally different from the smooth classical spaces we are used to from classical general relativity. Yeah. So, uh, and yeah, although in principle, if we understood all aspects of quantum gravity, quantum space time at the Planck scale, we should be able, you know, to answer every possible question that, you know, even arises in some far-flung uh, corner of the classical theory. In practice, this is, you know, similar to expecting that life will find an explanation in solving the Schrödinger equation. Yes, we agree that in principle that might be the case, but in practice, it's a too tall order. For, you know, to be addressed 
within a single uh, lifetime. Um, okay, maybe I'll stop and, and take, take questions before I make this more concrete, if there are any. So far, I don't see any, but we can give it some time. Uh, Hi, Renata. I'm... This is Roberto here. Hi, Roberto. Good. Uh, I just uh, wanted to point out that perhaps it's, we shouldn't give uh, for granted that uh, fluctuations, quantum fluctuations at very short scale are very large. Uh, this depends on what you put, what on the action that you choose. So I think if you put in certain uh, actions like R square, uh, then it will suppress uh, fluctuations also at short distances, much more than Einstein's. Yeah, but I, 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 totally correct. So it, it will not apply to any model of quantum gravity, but uh, the expectation might be that it, at least in some, it might be a realistic way of describing what happens at the Planck scale. Of course, we, we don't ultimately know. Sure, sure, I agree. Shall I continue? The interesting stuff is anyway coming. This was more like general, general remarks. So yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. So so this is about you know modulo putting in an R squared term with a really really big constant in front of it. Uh, let's think about what you know non perturbative geometry uh, might actually imply. Uh, uh, concretely. So, uh, and going back to the, my previous slide, you know, comparing smooth classical geometry with uh, these quantum objects. So, it is very likely the case that, you know, your favorite semi classical or classical question or calculation, uh, which you would like quantum gravity to say something about does not actually have an obvious quantum analog for one of many reasons. Number one, of course, it needs to be rephrased in terms of observables, quantum observables and their eigenvalues to be able to say something about it in the quantum theory. It uh, shouldn't refer to a background structure, a background metric, yeah? uh, because it's likely that it's likely not to have a good uh, Planckian quantum counterpart. Uh, if it makes use of very detailed local tensor structure classically, uh, it may be very difficult to rephrase it in terms of kind of coarser metric structures. So I'm uh, thinking that, you know, some kind of measurement prescription using, you know, quantum versions of, of rods and clocks. And of course, that's, that really relates to regularization and renormalization of uh, quantities. And it might not exist for your favorite uh, object. Uh, and also, of course, uh, being able to compute things. So that will be, of course, an essential part of uh, interesting models. Uh, will only give you access, you know, computational access, probably in a in a in a window of length scales. And uh, what you're trying to measure may be either much too big or much too small for us to see anything. So. That's also an important kind of practical, uh, but nevertheless essential uh, ingredient in, in, in four dimensions. Of course, in lower dimensions, you may be able to, to, to do more and do things uh, analytically. Now, so what I want to emphasize is that nevertheless, well, there are interesting things. So maybe a more fruitful way is actually to ask now, what can we now compute? You know, that does actually conform uh, to, to these requirements. And of course, it's not, uh, so it, it would be a category error, again, to ask quantum gravity or non perturbative quantum gravity in particular to answer any question you may have about classical or semi-classical uh, gravity. But what, what, of course, our primary concern is here, basically, to, to understand in the first place, you know, when, we, when I talk about quantum space-time, something like you know, a ground state, kind of the, what I call you the mother of all vacua and its structure. And uh, well, with some luck, one might imagine such a ground state, uh, you know, to have at least on coarse grain scales, something like, you know, be roughly isotropic and roughly homogeneous. And in that case, uh, of course, also, having only access to very global 
observables may actually not be such a restriction. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so 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 life is maybe not as hopeless as 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 it as it might seem. Now, so coming to the more concrete part of uh, giving some examples of of what I just uh, talked about in in more abstract ways. So I'm now turning to this formulation of causal dynamical triangulations. So the approach of quantum gravity I've been working with. So uh, and really for the purposes of this talk, I have to you know take it largely as a black box that enables me by turning a crank you know, to say something about certain uh, quantum non-perturbative quantum observables. So I won't have very much time to go into any of the details. If you are interested, here are a couple uh, somewhat older uh, review from physics reports I wrote with my uh, close collaborators here and the more recent uh, review I, I, um, I wrote for classical quantum gravity uh, a bit more than a year ago. Okay, so what's the essence? We are treating quantum gravity as a quantum field theory, basically taking our cue from the very successful example of lattice QCD, whose non-perturbative properties have been studied on a lattice. So the point here is to put gravity on the lattice, but do it properly. Do it properly, correctly, by that I mean without messing with the symmetry structures, which is that of diffeomorphism invariants in, in the classical continuum theory. So what we are looking for, and what I claim we actually we have, uh, at least in, in, in some formulations of quantum gravity, is a, a counterpart of Wilson's way of putting gauge fields on the lattice. The beauty being that there is a residual gauge invariance, remember it's local, of course, in, in, in gauge field theory, that kind of is associated with the vertices of a, a say, hypercubic lattice. So there is a residual gauge invariance, but it's exact. So that's very helpful in the construction and has been extremely important uh, in leading to all these developments in, in, in lattice QCD, say. Now, we need an analog for gravity, but the nature of the gauge group is very different. So actually what happens is something that I would say is even uh, better and stronger than Wilson formulation was for gauge fields. Namely, if we adopt piecewise flat geometries in the spirit of, of, of Regge, which I'll explain on, on the next slide, we actually uh, end up with a prescription that is does not even have a residual gauge invariance, but is kind of really truly describes physical uh, degrees of freedom. And CDT is kind of a, uh, maybe the most modern incarnation uh, making use of that idea. So it's a non-perturbative background independent uh, path integral. So on the space curly GM of geometries, of course, in some regularized version, we are putting things on the lattice. The idea being here, exactly like in lattice QCD, you introduce a regulator that has, amongst other things, you know, a UV cutoff, kind of the lattice spacing. And in the end, of course, we remove these regulators and uh, try and understand how, with suitable renormalization, uh, how physics behaves and try to understand whether there's actually a, a, a continuum theory behind this. Um, note, there is no, uh, there is no fundamental discreteness implied, at least in that philosophy. So it's really, the discrete structures that appear, the triangulations, they are really just to be thought of as, as regulators. And uh, they should be you know, shrunk away and hopefully discovering physics that uh, is reasonably universal and doesn't depend on the details of, of this regularization. But this is just the, the background to what I will say, of course, and what, what I use as my framework to say something about quantum observables. Now. Very importantly, however, let me spend a couple of minutes on that, is how diffeomorphisms are treated. And I have, it was already implicit in what I said, really this setup that uh, uh, Reggie came up with in 1961 in the context of trying to solve numerically the Einstein equation, simply you know, describing a classical evolution, uh, really 
is very, very powerful when it comes to setting up a, a non perturbative path integral. So the idea is probably familiar to many of you, but let me repeat it anyway, to approximate smooth curved space time. So this is not purely classical by simplicial manifold. The simplex is a triangle or generalization of, of a triangle to, to higher dimensions. And by definition, you have triangular building blocks that uh, are flat on the inside. Uh, so there are pieces, say, cut out of Euclidean flat space, if you're purely Euclidean, or out of Minkowski space, yeah, where, of course, the light cones may, may, may lie whichever way in such a building block. So, so individually, these building blocks are flat by definition. And it turns out that in that case, the giving the length of all the edges that make up an individual building block completely determines the flat geometry in its interior. So here I've drawn for you uh, an example of a, of a building block in four dimensions. It's a little difficult to, uh, to wrap one's head around, of course. Uh, here it's, it happens to be a building block that has um, blue, it has some space-like edges and it has some time-like edges. So it's really it's a Minkowski building block, but the, really the, the, the idea is uh, I just have to give you the edge length and I know the entire geometry, but of course it's flat in the interior. So how come I can arrive at curved spaces and space times? Well, it happens when I glue things together. Curvature will appear at uh, sub-simplices of dimension D minus two, if my simplices are of dimension D, uh, like happens say in two dimension as illustrated by this little picture here at the bottom. Yeah? So think of equilateral triangles, uh, just for simplicity, illustrating the situation in two dimensions. Glue those around five of them around the vertex. Yeah? So of course, all the angles are 60 degree angles. Then it's clear that at this vertex, there must be curvature kind of in a, in a singular delta function like fashion yeah? that gives rise to the surface having intrinsic positive Gaussian curvature. And the way to detect it is, or to visualize it, is to think of you know, cutting open this ensemble and putting it out on the flat table. Then a deficit angle, epsilon, of 60 degrees will appear, which is, is a direct measure of the intrinsic Gaussian curvature of this two-dimensional piece of triangulated space that, that I, had, I started with. Yeah? So, so the idea here really is, uh, by gluing together in any dimension uh, for any signature, uh, you, you, you choose building blocks in such a way that you get what's called a simplicial manifold. You will obtain spaces that can, for some purposes, be thought of approximations to smooth curved manifolds. Yeah? So exactly the objects, of course, we, we are interested in, in the classical GR, but now we are going to use this in the quantum theory and crucially, uh, the, the carrier space of, of path integrals uh, uh, of, of both dynamical triangulations, kind of in Euclidean signature or uh, CDT in, in Minkowski signature, uh, use such configuration spaces of uh, building blocks, you know, of, of, of building blocks assembled according to, uh, to, 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 such, to such gluing rules. So uh, uh, the special thing is that the building blocks are equilateral. In, in CDT or the Euclidean version DT, up to possibly uh, you know, distinguishing, as I did in this building block, cubic time and space like directions. Now, what is the crucial property? I never need to introduce any coordinates to describe these piecewise flat or simplicial manifolds. I only need to give you the, the edge lengths of all the building blocks, and I give, need to give you a table of how I glue them together. So how I identify them kind of pairwise across D minus one dimensional faces, and that's it. So uh, when one builds path integrals out of those, there, there are no coordinates. There is no coordinate redundancy. Of course, so it's actually, it takes a slight twist. You have to, in order to be able to work with these building blocks in the computer, you have to give them labels. And you give you know, simplices labels, and you may also want to give the coordinates some labels. But 
you can set up the Monte Carlo simulation in a very simple way in order that these labels are taken into account. So the overcounting that ensues, you know, is, is, a, is an analog of the, of the coordinate redundancy in the, in the smooth continuum, yeah, is completely taken care of just, you know, while you're constructing, uh, while you're setting up uh, the computations. So uh, that completely gets rid of the issue of diffeomorphisms by in this regularized framework. And that's very important and doesn't have any obvious and immediate analog in a continuum formulation. So that's a crucial way of how we get rid of diffeomorphisms. Now let's see also how that helps us uh, you know, does that make the construction of quantum observables trivial? No, the answer is no. So, so let me briefly say something about uh, CDT and then say something about observables. So CDT is actually an, a Lorentzian version of a, in many aspects, very successful framework that existed before, namely that of DT or dynamical triangulation, which can be thought of as a version of Euclidean quantum gravity. So it did address and solve many issues of previous lattice gravity formulations, which I don't have now uh, time to, to, to go into, and enabled one to really quantitatively evaluate certain observables. So I'm, I'm, I'm citing a spectral and house of dimension. I'll return to those later and enable them, uh, one really to compute and understand them in a regime very far from you know, classical looking geometries. Uh, it also addressed various other issues that are more important from the point of view of, hey, what kind of quantum gravity theory is it? But let, let me not go into them. So here is the key dynamical quantity that one is working with, namely the path integral. So here on the left, we are now in Euclidean signature. So that's DT, you know, if you like. So we have a, uh, just a path integral over formally a quotient, which I now, I don't call it matrix of M, but Riemannian matrix of M divided by diffeomorphism. So some formal integration over geometries yeah, here uh, in this formal continuum expression, which you are weighing with Boltzmann weights that know about the einstein hilbert action, could be more complicated action, but that's the simplest thing uh, that, uh, that one can consider. And what happens now in dynamical triangulation is that this formal expression is now substituted by a concrete, regularized, well-defined and finite expression that you evaluate on a configuration space of triangulations of finite size. So the size of the formulation uh, of, the, of the triangulation, which are called T, these triangulations, is one of your regulators and kind of the, the, the lattice spacing, uh, kind of the little a, uh, is kind of the UV uh, cut off here. And then you can put this on a computer and you can just study its properties and you can study observables. Now, so that's simple and powerful in principle. Now, it turned out that unfortunately it didn't seem to give interesting results. And that led then to uh, my co collaborators and myself to consider a kind of a more Lorentzian version of this originally purely Euclidean path integral setup where uh, the classical starting point, not classical, but continuum, formal continuum starting point is now kind of a Lorentzian uh, matrix module diffeomorphism. And they get represented on the regularized side by a set of inequivalent kind of causal dynamical uh, triangulations, which are building blocks with building blocks cut out from this Minkowski space and assembled uh, in some consistent way. And uh, now, <laughs> Putting this in a computer uh, doesn't make much sense uh, because of the I here in the exponent. But uh, of course, very importantly, we have a notion of analytic continuation in, in this framework that enables us to rotate this uh, back and make, make set of computer simulations and computations in a Euclidean regime. So what is the uh, what's, what's, uh, upshot, right, before I now come to the true uh, to, to discussing concrete observables. Well, various nasty things that seem to happen and seem to be in the way of good, interesting results coming out of the Euclidean formulation now 
seem no, no longer to be present in the causal uh, formulation. And in particular, what one finds if one sits in an appropriate region of the phase space uh, of the model, one finds an extended four dimensional space time with uh, overall shape of a de Sitter universe. So that's even more exciting uh, because you know some it smells like a good classical limit. Uh, and of course, everything is evaluated in a continuum and scaling limit where uh, the lattice regulators are, uh, are taken to zero or, or infinity. So the model itself has various other nice property. Uh, I mentioned refraction positivity. We have second order phase transition. Um, but let this be whatever it is. And let's now turn to observables. So the statement is that really everything we know we have understood about this model, this candidate theory of quantum gravity, uh, starting with DT, but in the more recent version of CDT, uh, really comes from studying quantum observables. So what I mean here is, you know, observables I'm evaluating uh, in, you know, my vacuum state, you like, I evaluating a given quantum observable by inserting it kind of in, into the path integral. So some quantity that just depends on geometry. And how is geometry given to me in these piecewise flat kind of ratchet type geometries? Well, uh, the, the setup enables me, uh, uh, the, the ratchet setup to, uh, to have analogs and or, or rather to measure distances in the sense of geodesic distances in the kind of Euclidianized regime as Kind of geodesic shortest path on a triangulation and it also enables me to perform volume measurements and putting these two things together i have you know what i called before quantum rods and clocks well the clocks are are euclidianized but but never mind and they enable me to construct kind of geometric or pre-geometric observables and that was already the case in dt in the euclidean version and made it potentially very powerful so what is an example of such a quantum observable? Well, it's, for instance, the Hausdorff dimension. So what's the Hausdorff dimension? Hausdorff is one of uh, a set of, you know, measures of dimension, which you obtain by comparing the volume of geodesic balls of a certain radius. So that involves both distance and volume measurements, which I can do. Uh, and uh, kind of try to understand how the volume scales to leading, uh, what is the leading behavior as a power of, of this radius. People have studied that starting in kind of two dimensional Euclidean toy models, which were extremely popular uh, in, in the 80s, uh, like Liouville uh, gravity yeah, in, in two dimensions. And what one finds is, so here is a, a, a little picture of what a geometry, a quantum geometry looks like in, in Liouville gravity when you regularize it with triangles. Now, when you measure the Hausdorff dimension, extracting it from volume measurements, as I just told you, the Hausdorff dimension is four. So very interestingly, you're putting together 2D building blocks, you take a scaling limit, you measure the Hausdorff dimension operationally, as I just told you, and it turns out to be four. So very unexpected, yeah? A classical, uh, how is it possible that an object I glue from two dimensional triangles has an effective dimension of four? Well, this is just what happens when quantum, fluctua quantum geometry is allowed to fluctuate. Yeah? In that case, it's a quantity you can also compute analytically and convince yourself that this is the correct result. But it also tells you something, namely that you know, classical geometrical quantities you kind of naively translate to such a lattice formulation will in general behave anomalously. So they will behave different from what you would expect, you know, from kind of canonical scaling of a length or, or a dimension. Uh, looking at these dimensions has provided uh, enormously rich information already before talking about geometry in for instance, characterizing Euclidean higher dimensional DT models as probably not very interesting, because if you look at the Hausdorff dimension, it comes out to be either two or infinite, yeah, which has prevented 
kind of recovering four dimensional geometry from them and was one of the reasons for looking at CDT. Now, uh, many people have taken up looking at such dimensions as a criterion, you know, for hey, can my quantum gravity theory possibly have anything to do with four dimensional classical extended space times? And that brings me to the, the spectral dimension, of course, familiar uh, probably to many of you, and many of you may have already computed such a spectral dimension in your own favorite model of quantum gravity. So uh, like the Hausdorff dimension, one can also obtain it purely from distance and also volume measurements. So one way of, so where does it come from? It comes from setting up a diffusion process in some unknown metric space you're considering whose dimension you would like to determine. Yeah. So let's call this metric space M, let it have some volume V, so everything will always happen in, in, in compact uh, volumes, set up a diffusion process and look at what I here call the average return probability. Yeah. You have random walkers which kind of underlie your diffusion process, if you like, that start at a point X and you are integrating, you know, uh, how how, what is the probability for something to return to the point X after diffusion time sigma? So you do that for all points X in your manifold and you normalize by, by the volume of the manifold. And then again, you extract kind of the leading behavior as, as in the form of a power law to extract this dimension DS, the so-called spectral dimension. Now, um, so this works on very, very many and very general spaces. You know, as long as you has, have a kind of Laplace uh, type, type operator, which you can associate with this uh, diffusion process. And it was done many, many years ago. That's why I call it an old observable in CDT. And we found this amazing scale dependence of this as a function of sigma. So what you see here is actually, you know, uh, actual measurements uh, on lattices of a few hundred thousand building blocks in four dimensional uh, CDT quantum gravity, uh, which we then used, you know, from within a reliable window, we extrapolated uh, this to, to continuum behavior. And it gives rise to uh, uh, a dimension that we call dynamically, you know, generated that uh, for very small scales seem to be somewhere near two, and for large scales kind of asymptotes to the classically expected value of four. Now, very interestingly, that has since been found in many approaches uh, to be the case, or at least qualitatively, you know, including, uh, of course, FRG um, considerations and asymptotic safety, and has given rise to the speculation that it may actually be a universal feature of quantum gravity. And it's very exciting. And why have so many people looked at it? Because there are so few things we can compute. There are so few observables we have. And so we are, you know, we are, you know, trying to beat it as much as we can to learn as much about, you know, quantum gravity and our own models by just looking at these uh, dimensions to start with. So that's something we learned from two dimensions and uh, have gone to four dimensions. But of course, it raises also the question: Hey, is there anything more, you know, that, that has to do more with more with geometry uh, rather than notions of dimension? Renate, you have a little yes. less than 10 minutes left. I have less than 10 minutes left. Maybe I just wrap up and I collect uh, all the questions and I hope I hope that's okay. So um, it's it's it will just fit into what I into these last uh, few minutes. So we have, you know, I mentioned in passing that what CDT kind of produces for you, at least in a in a part of the of, of the phase space of the model, I mean, the space of spent by the bare coupling constants is a, an extended universe that on large scales has spectral and Hausdorff dimension four, so which is very encouraging. But if you zoom in on its shape, by which I mean the spatial volume as a function of proper time, which we have direct access to, then it can be matched to very great accuracy with that of a Euclidean the sitter space. So we call that the volume profile. And here you see this picture is the volume profile. So don't mistake it for a, a prescription or for, for a picture of 
what geometry looks like. Geometry will much more, you know, look like these very wild things. But just having picked out one of the variables, which is, you know, has been put put here, the, the, the three-dimensional volume as a function of proper time. So its expectation value has been matched beautifully to 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 that of a Euclidean, because we are in a Vic rotated framework uh, to sit in space. Now it raises the question. Are there any other observables we, we can measure that would nail this down to, you know, also being geometrically having something to do with the De Sitter space? And of course, the first thing that comes to mind is, hey, De Sitter space classically is just a constantly curved space. Can I say anything about the curvature of these very wild objects? Uh, and there was no notion, uh, no well-defined kind of renormalized notion of curvature that was until recently available that you could just evaluate in this Planckian regime and get a sensible answer. Now, since very recently, we have such a quantity. So of course, it's not a priori absolutely not clear that it should exist at all. Yeah, when you have a non-smooth metric space that is, of course, very, very singular from a classical point of view. And you know, just thinking of the classical Riemann tensor, right? You need G mu nu to be twice differentiable to get a nice uh, Riemann curvature tensor. So, uh, is there a way, you know, say we can take well something like a simplicial manifold, or even something even more, you know, crazy and coarse like a graph with some metric assignments and associate a curvature with it? Now, uh, I come back to a point I made earlier. Well, lots of progress has been made in mathematics in studying geometry beyond classical Riemann. Yeah? And people in working in discrete mathematics have actually, it's, it's, it's a somewhat of a booming a business, actually are looking into generalized notions of curvature. And what I and uh, my student Nilas Gritko have done is actually inspired by some such development, uh, defining a notion of Ritchie curvature that is applicable in a Planckian regime on our Planckian space times, pieces of space time. So that's what we call the quantum Ritchie curvature. And again, it's based on only being able to make volume and distance measurements. So what's the crucial insight that comes purely from you know, classical smooth geometry is to say, OK, if I sit on a metric space that has positive which you curvature. If I look at two small, sufficiently small infinitesimal balls or, or spheres of radius epsilon, whose centers are a sufficiently small distance delta apart, if I compare the distance between their centers with the distance between those two um, spheres, you know, regarded as point sets, then when I'm on a positively curved uh, 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 space, then uh, the, the, the distance d bar between the spheres is smaller than the distance between the centers. And conversely, when I sit on a negatively witchy curved space, always of Riemannian signature, then the opposite is the case. You know? And you can, you, are, you can try to visualize that. And it, well, it, it's a beautiful idea. What's even more beautiful is that it's applicable in very generic metric spaces. And that's what we have applied and, 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 and put to work after some, you know, uh, making it adaptable to, 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 to the uh, piece of uh, rigid geometries we've uh, implemented and, uh, and computed in the context of, of, of these quantum gravitational path integrals. And what we're using are is a single scale, so we don't keep separate the scale of the spheres and the distance, but we choose those two equal. So the epsilon is equal to delta in this up, upper picture. So we, we consider pairs of spheres uh, with a scale delta, so they are associated with a linear scale, and we evaluate then a quantity from which we extract the Ritchie curvature. The quantity we evaluate is the quotient. Yeah? of the, the distance between the spheres and the distance between the centers as here. And this has, when one does this classically, what one finds is a lowest order term, yeah, which is a constant, plus a correction term proportional to delta squared, which contains the curvature precisely. So that's quite clear for dimensional reasons, and it has to be like that. 
if you make the computation just in the continuum for infinitesimal spheres on a Riemannian manifold, you can do that, say, in Riemann normal coordinates. The result is exactly of the form I just told you, with constants that depend on the dimension and a, a kind of correction term that knows about the Ricci curvature, where V is a connecting, is a kind of the, the, the vector pointing from the center of the first sphere to that of the second. Yeah. So we can extract Ritchie curvature from looking at how the quotient of those two distances behaves as a function of delta. If it stays completely flat, yeah, that means there is no contribution from what I call KQ here. If it turns up, there is negative curvature. If it goes down, there is positive curvature. So the beauty of that is it involves only distance and volume measurements. It's it's, it has a distance depends, although we are not having access to tensors, right? Uh, it's still a direction dependent quantity and it's the first such quantity we have. It's not an observable, you know, the Ricci curvature is not an observable, but uh, for instance, of course, when you're taking the trace and integrating it over space, that's the simplest thing you can do, you get an average Ricci scalar. Yeah? And that is an observable, both classically and quantum. And that is what we have evaluated. And just uh, let me take uh, one minute to, to describe this result before concluding. So what we're doing is we are computing quantum rich scalar in this case, because we integrate over all pairs of spheres on our quantum ensemble, where that look like the Zitter spaces in terms of their shape. Now we are trying to understand what's a curvature like. What do we have? What do we compare it to the curvature measurements? We compare them to the same measurements we can in analytic computation, we can easily do on a constantly curved continuum Riemannian space of this quantity, the, which is the, the dimensionless quotient of the two distances, the sphere distance over the center distance. What we find is a flat space, you know, zero. Uh, just for comparison purposes, hyperbolic space would look like that. Uh, uh, positively curved sphere looks like this. So we measure this quantity in four dimensions of CDT in the so-called de Sitter phase, uh, where uh, the topology of these objects is S3 plus S1. We do it at, at, at volumes of you know, more than a million building blocks. We collect data for months. <laughs> and this is the curve we find for the Delta D, the expectation value divided by uh, the D bar, expectation value divided by delta. Delta is, of course, fixed and chosen and, and flexible and uh, variable and here on the, on the x axis. So, and what we are doing, we are subtracting a region where we know from various other means that it's just a region where lattice artifacts are dominating. And we compare the remainder to a relevant piece here on these curves. And what we find is that very clearly, we see the numbers go down. So clearly the, the curvature is positive, yeah? but it can also be mapped to that of a fourth sphere with you know, some degree of accuracy that is not amazingly wonderful because these are very, very tricky computations to make, but looks already pretty good. Plus we can also, we have understood uh, that if we, compute rigid curvature in the time direction and spatial directions, they seem to be the same or comparable, which means it is a beautiful result because it means restoration kind of, of you know, time space symmetry, despite uh, starting out with a uh, quite different uh, kind of an isotropic looking uh, ensemble of geometries. Okay, back to quantum observables and summary of what I said. So, Constructing and evaluating quantum observables is really crucial for understanding gravity and space time. Also, in, of course, and in particular in this non perturbative Planckian regime. Having a concrete calculational framework like we have in DT or CDT really helps to inject kind of some realism in a often quite abstract debate. And it helps to shape and sharpen our expectations of what is actually accessible computationally and uh, what kind of statements we can make and what quantum gravity is all about. Um, now, the way in which diffeomorphism invariance is addressed will be very crucial in 
CDT and DT, it happens in a very specific way, which seems very important. How this may work in other uh, approaches which treat different morphisms differently, I do not know, but it's a very interesting question. Now, uh, in terms of general open problems, so I could talk for those about a, a long time, but let me confine myself to uh, a few points. So just general points on quantum observables. Of course, we need more, more, more of them. And uh, well, I think everyone can sign up to that. Uh, we need to understand how they behave under coarse graining and renormalization. And that's a very non-trivial thing to investigate in non-perturbative quantum gravity, where there often there is no a priori, uh, there is no a priori scale with respect to which you can perform this. And uh, well, if you renormalize, regularize, this is often non-unique um, or doesn't exist. So that's a tricky part. Uh, then very importantly, we need to understand and think of ways how to compare these observables, which you know, are very non-local and may behave anomalously in some way to, well, semi-classical results, let's say, you know, early universe computations that people do that also involve the sitter space, but that are, you know, background dependent and or perturbative and, you know, quite classical. So how do we relate to them? Uh, you know, what kind of, what are, what are the observables that are easiest to, to compare be, between, you know, coming from the non-perturbative side and coming from the more, more classical minded side, which of course relates to, to phenomenology. So, Point number three is really important to making progress and hopefully in the not too distant future is not point number four, but which I understand is, is the subject of the next series of, of seminars in, uh, with AA. So that was it. Thank you very much for listening. Yeah, thank you, Renate, for this very nice pedagogical talk. Um, before we start with the questions, please use the raise hand feature under reactions so that we can keep track of who's having questions. I think Steve Giddings, you already had a uh, question or not? Yes, uh, sorry. Hi, uh, thank you, Renata, for the nice talk. Um, a comment and a question. First of all, uh, it seemed like you suggested that uh, the number of observables should be rather limited. But, you know, really, if you think about it, you know, a lot of the things that we would describe in field theory should have a diff invariant analog. Say a detector observes a particle, there should be a diff invariant description of that uh, in weak gravity. And probably, you know, one way of approaching that is either via uh, sort of dressed of observables or relational observables like we've heard about uh, earlier. So, so in fact, and maybe you're really getting back to that in this last slide, there, there should be you know, many, many observables in the construction of a quantum theory of gravity. Uh, so that's the comment. And then the question is, uh, what is the status of describing chiral fermions, which we observe in nature, uh, in the context of CDT? Uh, I don't have a question answer to the la last question, but I have an answer to the first question. Uh, so, you know, I, you know, I completely agree. In principle, obviously, there there must be infinitely many observables. Yeah. So, and well, it's just what I said. There are few. Is there are few we have identified that are uh, computationally accessible. You know, in principle, you could say. Look, you know, with ever with now I have defined a curvature. Well, please, you know, define diffeomorphism invariant kind of integrated versions of, of endpoint functions based on that curvature. Uh, these are in principle good observables. They're just kind of uh, quite out of reach, you know, in any in any technical sense. So they're they're clearly there, but also already classically, of course, we have trouble. You know, if we kind of insist that you know, observers should be diff M invariant, yeah, how, how to retrieve from uh, very non-local information that these have, how to retrieve, you know, answers to typical, often very local questions we ask about specific geometries. 
Thanks. If I may follow up on this, on the actual question, so what is the attitude of this approach towards chiral fermions and their existence in nature? Uh, you know, if this is a fundamental description of gravity underlying the rest of nature, how am I, you know, I need to have a way of approaching the question of chiral fermions. So what's the, the attitude you take? Well, I don't know why I shouldn't be able to address them. Well, I mean, there are known issues with chiral fermions on lattices in general, right? So yeah. it's, you know, I, I was just wondering what the yeah. status of thinking no, is. I, I, don't, I don't see any magic wand of anything we intrinsically add yeah, to, to ameliorate uh, these issues within quantum gravity. Okay, thank you. And I'm not, yeah. Okay, um, Arthur, you have posed a question in the chat. Do you want to ask it now? Uh, sure, thank you. And thank you very much for the talk. Unfortunately, I think this is a very naive question. Um, I'm kind of an outsider, but is there a notion of what an observer is? Like, uh, for instance, I don't know how actually length and area are measured in the first place, who or what measures them? No, there is, no, this is just, you know, this is just applying standard standard quantum quantum theory or structures of quantum theory. So uh, in the same way as you do in, in under other quantum field theories. So there is no specific status to, there is no observer included in this description. And so, I don't, I mean, of course, I mean, people do say, well, in a context, you know, where I think about quantum cosmology or describing the entire universe, I should be really concerned about this, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure the same is the case if I just, you know, try and describe a small piece of quantum space-time, you know, that that is not necessarily, you know, the entire universe. Yeah, of course, there is not not just one piece, but like, you know, there's a piece here, there's a piece here, there's a piece here. So I don't have the, the kind of the standard um, interpretational issues I would have I have in quantum cosmology. I see, thank you. Reinhard Eichhofer, please. Uh, yes, thank you very much for this nice talk. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, as an example, Young Will's theory, I would have a very general question. And, and for this, uh, let me first uh, give a very short explanation what spoke hadron duality, which is a very important notion in QCD. Quark hadron duality is the expression I can. Quark duality, sorry, say it again. Quark and hadrons. Quark hadron duality. Quark hadron duality. Okay. Yeah, I can. Mm -hmm. The statement is the following: I can describe all observables of hadron physics in the language of QCD, that is, with quarks and glue, or I can do this using only hadrons at the expense of inducing non-localities, having to deal with non uh, unstable particles and so on. Yeah? But both descriptions should be possible. They're completely orthogonal. That's a consequence of confinement. And uh, nevertheless, uh, one has then as a concept just something like a hadronic state space. Uh, and uh, this is far more than only observables, but it's a very enlightening or very uh, uh, teaching uh, intermediary concept uh, uh, going from quarks and gluons uh, to hadronic observables like a bump in, in, in a cross section. Can you imagine something intermediary, something similar intermediary concept in, in, in gravity? Yeah, well, I think, you know, amongst other things, it, it touches on this very interesting issue of, you know, locality, <laughs> I would say, because... Exactly. Uh, you know, why, well, first of all, why do we work with gauge potentials in the first place, right, in, in gauge field theory? Because they enable us to formulate the theory in a, in a local, covariant, blah, blah, etc. way. Exactly. And, and, and keeping but, up... But, but, but the physics, but very interestingly, but kind of, you know, what I would call, there's a true degree of freedom if, if you try to reduce to those, well, then non-locality typically sneaks in. So... And I would say in gravity, this looks a bit similar. Yeah. The, the real problem with losing locality is, is of course that you have no chance anymore to, to have causality. Yeah? Uh, 
if uh, interactions are non-local, how in heaven uh, can can you then formulate uh, a theory which respects microcausality? Yeah, well, I'm not saying that the theory is non-local, but if we try yeah. and you know write it in purely physical you know variables, we know that kind of non-locality sneaks in. That that yeah. might be just because yeah, our yeah. prescription that there's some fault with our thinking about it or our prescription our no, choice no, of variables but my point was more can one build up to try to get something intermediary between the, the diffeomorphism invariant formulation and immediately going to observables is there something in between which helps us uh, getting that link uh, like something like a hadronic state space in 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 qcd Huh? I, I would say, you know, studying observables and studying, you know, how they behave under coarse graining might give us some hints, but uh, yeah, that, that's all I can, can say. But yeah, it's, it's a very interesting question. Thanks. Jose? Um, hi, I hope you can hear me. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much uh, for the talk. It was really pedagogical. Um, I have two questions, two small questions that relate to the to the curvature uh, notion. It's uh, quantum which is scalar. So the first is a very simple one. It has to do with uh, the need for for this notion of curvature. I mean, because when you define the model, you already need to use a notion of discrete curvature um, local. I mean, you 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 mentioned it yourself. This uh, uh, discrete Gaussian curvature. So I guess the the question then is. Can't you, this gives you a function from the full simplicial manifold um, to, to the numbers um, for every configuration that you consider. So can't you just simply consider some, some averaging uh, of this function, for example? Um, so th th that's the, the first question. And then the second question is, if I understood correctly, so I, I didn't quite get the details, but regarding this quantum rich scalar, at some point, you have to compare some, some distances uh, between the spheres. And anyways, you, you say that you can actually make distance measurements. And my question is, um, in general, if, you, if we work on, on Lorentzian manifolds, we don't really have um, a notion of distance at hand because the, the metric is um, non-definite. So is there any way in which you can constrain the configurations that you work with in such a way that you actually have this distance, this distance function always defined? Yeah, so let yeah, two, two excellent questions. So let me start with the, the second one. So we always, you know, I, I said at the level of the regularized geometries, I said in passing, uh, we have an analytic continuation. So we do start from, you know, uh, Lorentzian piecewise flood manifolds, but we have an analytic continuation of one of the parameters describing these objects. So, so we can perform an actual, a well defined big rotation. And in the recortated sector, we do all this computation, including you know, curvature computations. Yeah. Of course, then we have to reinterpret them in terms of Lorentzian quantities. But uh, so we, we always work, so all we extract from simulations and uh, really this prescription you know, of uh, looking at sphere distances that comes from Romanian and it doesn't have a very nice Lorentzian analog, so it would be difficult to, to, to think of it. I mean, people have played around with it. I mean, I mean, not not quantum gravity people, but you kind of geometers. Um, uh, as for the first question, um, yeah. So there is, of course, gravity. Uh, gravity comes with a notion of curvature, which I explained, as you remarked correctly, which is that of deficit angles. Yeah. Unfortunately, this prescription kind of doesn't satisfy one of the you know, requirements on my list. It, it doesn't uh, renormalize in, in a nice way. So it's a well-defined notion on any given finite you know, triangulated piece by flat manifold. But when I look at the ensemble of those and I then consider a scaling limit, uh, this even the integrated Kind of scalar curvature coming from this deficit angle prescription it diverges in in a way uh, we don't know how to control or to renormalize in a you know in a well-defined you know unique way 
Uh, but that's very interesting. Do you have any heuristic understanding of why uh, this, this discrete curvature would diverge under renormalization? Uh, yeah, somewhat. I mean, uh, because it doesn't become small. <laughs> so it, it can, comes in discrete bits and it doesn't become small uh, when you take a scaling limit. So really it describes, it does describe a feature of these quantum geometries, which is where these basically these curvature defects become denser and denser, you know, as you take a scaling limit. Uh, and so uh, you could rephrase it by saying, well, this is really a quantity that's well defined only at the cutoff scale. And we don't have a nice way kind of, of course, graining it, you know, kind of think what, what would be a coarse grain deficit angle? I mean, we, we, we try to play around with such notions. I'm sure we're not the only ones, but we haven't been able to make sense of it. So it's really, from the point of view of the quantum theory, it's you know it's a prescription that kind of lives uh, quite essentially just at the cutoff scale, and doesn't seem to relate to to an interesting macroscopic notion of curvature. So it doesn't renormalize in, in a good way. Thank you very much. Aaron. Yeah, hi Renate, thanks for the talk. Can I just um, push a bit on the question whether you think that um, there are lessons that you can um, tell to other approaches or whether you can give sort of a recipe to other approaches on how to probe and then eventually compare these quantum observables? Well, of course, a crucial point in any approach is, but I guess that's already there in, in, in what you are doing, to have a, comp a functioning computational framework where you, you can actually compute some of these things. And I think that then throws a quite different light, you know, as I said in my summary on, on what's, what can hope, what can be hoped for, you know. Uh, and be creative. I think, you know, of course I, I evaluated some of these quantities. Well, I, I evaluated them in my framework, but they may well, there's nothing for instance in, in the quantum rich curvature that would prevent it, you know, from, from applying it in another kind of piecewise flat or discretized context. And that has already been done to some extent, right? I mean, I think people have looked at it in, uh, in causal sets. Uh, I don't know whether elsewhere. It's not so easy, you know, it's made for these dis discrete type geometries. So it's not so easy to translate it into, into continuum language. Thanks. Andreas, go ahead. Um, I hope you can hear me. My microphone has some problems. Um, thanks for the talk. Um, I have two questions which uh, rather touch on the first part of your presentation, um, namely um, uh, universality classes. Um, so what is the relation on CDT or what would you say uh, about the relation CDT to projectable or Java Lipschitz gravity? Um, so in 2D, um, they're supposed to be equivalent. In 3D and 4D, um, there is no consent, I think. Um, and I would be interested to understand um, why, in your opinion, if it holds in 2D. And also in regard to the work um, I mean, he's not around, but um, by Dario Benedetti on the relation in two plus one uh, dimensions. And then um, a little bit further, the second question is about, um, so there, there was this work of you and a previous student of yours, Jordan, on uh, locally uh, causal DT. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know what's the status of that um, program. And um, so there was that um, uh, work uh, with uh, another student then, um, where I think you looked at the one plus one dimensional case and you found in contrast to DT as a, uh, in the same universality class as uh, um, um, uh, viewable gravity and then uh, one plus one as um, as projectable or java lift sheets you found another or indications for another universality class 
and uh, would be interested in knowing uh, what's going on in higher dimensions and yeah. Okay, yeah. excellent. Here's someone who's actually looked at some of our papers. So that, that's great news to start with. So thanks for the good questions. So, so with regard to, to Hojava Lifshitz, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's completely correct that in two dimensions, well, many formulations of quantum gravity toy models uh, turn out to be equivalent, or as you said, lying in the same universality class. And the universality class, let's loosely define this here as, you know, sharing maybe uh, similar critical coefficients, which are, you know, things like spectral dimension and, uh, uh, and house of dimension. Yeah. So in two dimensions, it, it, it seems as if they're just, in general, they're just two universality classes. So one is the one of uh, Euclidean quantum gravity, and that is Liouville quantum gravity, and that's what DT quantum gravity is. And then there is kind of the, the other class, which has CDT in it, which has Ojava Lifshitz in it, which also has um, proper time gauge fixed uh, to the continuum gravity in it, which we already noticed, you know, when we when we solved uh, CDT analytically in two dimensions uh, a long time ago. Um, yeah, so universality is, is, is strong, you could say. Uh, so uh, can we take that as an indication that the same kind of, that translates to higher dimensions? Um, uh, for the case, you know, comparing CDT and Hojava uh, th certainly there is not an expectation or Although, you know, we in the old days, we, we, we speculated that this might be the case on the basis of comparing uh, spectral dimensions. Uh, but uh, I would say the reason that was connected to finding similar spectral dimensions, um, trying to understand whether that relates to common features of, of the two uh, series. Uh, we have looked at this for many, many years. We haven't been able to find anything, but we can say with some certainty that uh, the, uh, the symmetry structure, of course, of the two theories, if you formulate them kind of in the continuum, is of course different. So Ojava Lifshitz has a foliation, but it has broken diffeomorphism symmetry, right? Full diffeomorphism symmetry. So it has a different number of degrees of freedom. As we say, we are working on a space of geometries. So we are, CDT does not have broken uh, diffeomorphism uh, geometries. Yeah? So uh, the, the number of degrees of freedom should be the same as GR, although we have you know, a foliated structure in there. So one, but one shouldn't be mis misled by this. Uh, the reason why in 2D, well, there are zero you know, local degrees of freedom. So in 2D, these things don't, don't add up to any difference for the models. So there's no contradiction you know, with the thing being the same in two dimensions and different in higher dimensions. And uh, the reason why it's different in higher dimensions, as I said, is it, it has a different symmetry structure. And also, of course, since you know we were so surprised, and even also Peter was very surprised when he discovered that his spectral dimension looks like ours. Of course, we have since reproduced you know the spectral dimension, dimensional reduction in many, many other approaches which also kind of weakens the argument that, you know, they are, they are maybe all the same quantum gravities somewhat. Yeah. Um, so we had, uh, yeah, the second question related to uh, a model that uh, Samuel Jordan, indeed one of my former PhD students and I uh, studied, which uh, uh, was a model of uh, CDT where you distinguish, or you can kind of separate between the, the foliated structure and the causal structure. So in standard CDT, really the way you enforce the absence of, you know, topology changes in the time direction, yeah, uh, happens uh, through the, the, the sliced, um, uh, the, the sliced building up of, of, of the geometries. Uh, but why, you know, should should one be able not be able to separate these two things? And one can indeed do that when one allows more general building blocks. So just for people who haven't, uh, you don't, who are not aware of these results. And we were interested in that because we are, uh, you know, potentially one should be uh, wondering or maybe be concerned whether the presence of this foliated structure, you know, influences results in some well undue way, you know, that kind of messes, say, with the local degrees of freedom. 
so uh, this generalized model where these two things could be you know in imposed separate from each other the causality condition and uh, kind of a notion of time it it didn't actually have this fixed foliation we were able in two plus one to reproduce the same results as in the you know standard original cdt which was very satisfactory but it it was a, a model that was very much more complicated to compute with so uh, we are uh, we considered uh, what it would take to implement it in four dimensions and uh, decided that it's not a high priority to do that and at any rate it's not really feasible uh, to do it yeah and uh, so what of course since uh, so to address is the issue of you know what what role does the time foliation play uh, is really much better done at the level of observables and you know the very last point i mentioned when i start i talked about the Ritchie curvature so what we have found is uh, you know, for, for our, like, the mother of all vacua, where we see this de Sitterscheid object appearing. So already, you know, at the level, of course, of the shape, one, one, one thought of that as a restoration of a symmetry, right? The, the universe wants to become an S4 dynamically, whereas what we put in was actually a foliation of uh, uh, three spheres. You know, uh, so that was the first indication that actually, you know, a restoration, if you like, of time space symmetry uh, appears. Now, when we look at the quantum Ritchie curvature, we are able to compare quantum Ritchie curvature in time directions and in spatial directions. And what we also found that within measuring accuracy, uh, you know, it, in published as published in this very last paper uh, I wrote with with Klitko on this. Uh, these curvatures in these two directions also seem to agree. So again, uh, for su on sufficiently large scales, it appears one has a restoration indeed. So the, the, one has some good indication that uh, the foliation doesn't play any, any essential role in the continuum results we find. I hope that answers the question. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Okay, last two questions in the order, James and then Jin Zhao. Hi, thank you for the very interesting talk. Hopefully you can hear me, my microphone's working. Yes, I can hear you. Um, this is related to the question you just asked. As a newcomer to CDT, um, the, the diffeomorphism invariance is manifest in the case of DT, uh, as you described the label invariance. Um, but how does distinguishing between time-like and space-like edges not affect this diff diffeomorphism invariance? You, you've mentioned multiple times the time-like, the time foliation mm -hmm. of the structure not affecting the coordinate invariance. But I, I imagine as I'm working with some of this code that I could, um, you know, change space-like edges to time-like edges and, and so on, um, and that would not present the same structure. No, no, uh, I'm not saying. I mean, the, the, the symmetry that the the piece of flat object has is a relabeling symmetry. It's not swapping space-like and, and time-like edges. So that's I think that's a slight misunderstanding, maybe. So so there is no distinction really in uh, you know these being kind of intrinsically geometrical. Never mind whether in Euclidean or in Minkowskian uh, signature. Yeah, of course, the original Reggie prescription also was, of course, for, for Minkowskian signature. You know, that's what it was invented for. And it still describes geometry without coordinates. Okay, thank you. Okay, last question. Um, yes, um, thanks for the nice talk. Um, I have a question somewhat related to Arthur's question earlier. Um, and that is, um, if I consider this naive uh, observable, um, which is, say, the clock time measured by an observer free falling from one point to another, um, which is operationally defined and I think should be addressable in any theory of gravity, classical quantum, um, um, does, does CDT offer opinion on, on on, on you know what's uh, what's what's this observable uh, in the deeply quantum regime? Do we have a uh, 
a deviation from uh, equivalence principles, so to speak. Well, I, I, I'm afraid I don't have any good analog of what this would mean expressed in terms of, you know, observables that I have access to. So I, I don't know what that observer is and what, you know, her world line is in this non-perturbative context. I, I, so I have to ad agree with your first statement that it's operationally well-defined there. Okay. Yeah, it's just somewhat puzzling to me because so far in this series of observables in quantum gravity, it seems yeah. like no one is able, <laughs> I mean, no one gives a uh, uh, opinion on that simple observable. Yeah, but if you go back but to the list yeah. kind of, of, of things I, I'm able to address, you know, and okay. I have access mm -hmm. to. Uh, so, you know, I would say if only you manage to rephrase that, you know, in terms of you know, some observables which you may have to do some integrations, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not saying this is this is not trivial, but it's not clear that it cannot be done. But in the way you describe it, right, it's just the one, yeah. the one observer. Yeah. Well, I have to make sense of that in this non-perturbative sum over geometries. Okay, yeah, yeah? okay, yeah. So, yeah. so it's interesting whether one can do that, yeah, um, mm -hmm. but, Unfortunately, you know, many observables like, like the one you're quoting, well, one would like to investigate, you know, like one could also say, okay, you know, I, let me insert two point masses and, you know, let me uh, compute at a distance r and let me compute uh, what the expectation value is, right, of whatever curvature or, or gravitational force or something, the potential. Well, it's very, very difficult to come up with a uh, truly a non-perturbative observable that would cap capture some of these features, yeah? Yes, I agree. Yeah, I guess I see some perturbative calculations. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, so in effective field series. Yeah, yeah, yes. exactly. Yeah, exactly. But in I background, guess, uh, you know, you point to that mass and that mass, and then you have a good understanding maybe of what their distance is, but how do you keep these things, you know, well-defined in a, in a sum over geometries, where you mm -hmm. have to sum over all objects of a certain type? And you have to define things geometrically without, you know, referring to any external structures. It's mm. tricky. Yes. Okay. I agree. Thanks. Okay. And this concludes our seminar. So let us thank Renate again. <laughs> And of course, thank you very much for um, this very pedagogical talk and also for, to our participants for asking so many questions. If you want to continue the discussion, there's a Slack channel to Renata's talk and the link has been posted in the Zoom chat. And then see you at the next meeting where we want to have a panel discussion. So thank you very much.